good morning good afternoon and good evening because there are many people joining from various parts of the world like every time <clears throat> it's a saturday morning or afternoon or evening but it's good that you have invested your time and uh, that is more important and we are joining for a, a good discussion on on devops a particular tool like gitlab but to begin with because it's a second program and many of uh, you have not been able to for for what whatever reasons uh, you would not uh, you haven't gone through that particular program one where we had the first session entirely devoted on the devops know how i mean what is devops why is devops why why do we need to do i will briefly go go over the same thing but in a very brief period of, because my main focus would be on the the another tool which is gitlab gitlab because we have already covered you know uh, the aws the devops introduction the aws then we had your terraform ansible and today on the fifth day that is on the first day or, or the first session of our second program we are going to start with a brief introduction of devops we will go to gitlab today on next weekend we are going to have a very good overview on docker the containerization tool and on the following two weekends that is uh, the third week weekend and the fourth weekend we will have kubernetes kubernetes part 1 and part 2 that is more or less the road map so we have done a quite a lot of uh, uh, we have quite a good number of tools which are going to uh, give you a good overview and give you a good standing on on this particular tools so let's begin with devops and why we need to learn it that's a important very very important thing to understand before see any anything i start i must understand i must understand why we need to learn a particular topic is that any relevance to me whether i will be able to pick pick it up as uh, mr menon was telling you that is very important that you understand all these things your strong points your knack your affinity and your career goal all these things should be aligned and then only you should be able to understand that why you should learn this particular topic i am just a mentor and a guide and a and a tutor you know who will guide you through some basic tips and very important tips why you should be planning to take up devops because our our lives have become very complicated uh, in india particularly i am um, i'm giving an example like in india the competition is too high it, it is not to deny anything because of of uh, too much of your population too much of uh, competition in the market and so the companies are willing to only take you once you are very good at one thing now what is your option are you going to uh, go for a development job are you first of all going to step into it many of our students have come from various backgrounds various uh, domains it was not particularly it okay but we have guided them we have helped them we have mentored them into certain career path and they are now in big companies you know it's a big story uh, whenever we will have more such interactions we will come to you will come to know about lots of those success stories we had like one of one or two examples uh, what mr menon had given you was relevant so you have to be very clear in your mind let us let us just have a go through on why industry has adopted devops what was the big reason okay uh this symbol is very symbolic that is this is something like when i say this uh, when I, whenever i see this particular thing i have a feeling of i have a good feeling just to be very frank with you good feeling because uh, nothing is discrete you see everything is intertwined everyone is helping each other all these phases of software development life cycle i will go through briefly now there are few compelling business benefits of devops why industry has adopted devops why they could not avoid uh, uh, taking this particular thing into their fold there are seven these are the things that industry has come up with 
why they have come up with this. These are the seven big reasons. Uh, I, in a gist, it is to deliver a change as soon as you make them. So you have created a product and if you cannot deliver it fast in the, into the market, then what's the use? Because that novelty of that product will go. So something, some methodology, some uh, process should be there which will help you to automatically get this product into quickly into the market. Rapidly respond to customer impact. Now, you have put, uh, put a product into the market. That's okay. But maybe the customer reaction to that product could be good, could be bad, could be okay. Okay, it's okay product. So how do you respond to that? Because you have to quickly adapt to the customer feedback. That feedback mechanism and to incorporate that feedback into your uh, modifying the product quickly again and getting it back to the market with all the customer demands fulfilled. That is very important. And you do not have any other way other than DevOps to fulfill that. That, that is called the fulfillment. First thing, what you did was provisioning. Then there is fulfillment. In, in, if you are working in a telecom industry, these are the very important two terms. Provisioning, fulfillment. Any, any industry, only provisioning does not mean anything. You have to fulfill it. Quickly ad adjust your product into the market demand. And then after your product is okay, good, uh, customers are getting uh, hooked into your product that's good but then see to attain a particular level is is okay but to maintain certain degree of quality is the last uh, that is the most and uh, the four foremost thing that you need to do what is that you have to maintain the compliance security and reliability these are Maybe these are uh, not everyday use terms, not technical terms, but these are the terms. These are the buzzwords. What an industry is looking for that whatever you do should be compliant with the protocol, with the accepted industry practices. It should be secured and it has to be reliable. And also it has to be available through it is like the companies are looking for some products or something which you can run 100%. That means it will never have a downtime. Can you achieve this without DevOps? I doubt. Industry has a doubt. So therefore, they had adopted this methodology called DevOps. I'm not going through all the benefits of socioeconomic benefits. Our life has become too complicated, you know. There is too much of expectations, involvement, commitments. Sometimes you get mm, totally out of your mind. How will you, how do you adjust to all these things? So that is very important. Uh, we should be working in an environment which can help us to balance our work and life. So there should be a balance between our work and life. And one of the things that can be done through your work, your activity can be achieved through DevOps. These are various uh, things. Uh, you, you can go through it. Uh, everything now, whatever I'm discussing, whatever I am, uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation is there, you will get in our website if you have registered. OK, even the recording. And these are very common terms why we need. These are some very, very important socioeconomic benefits of learning DevOps. Now, I am just trying to understand that why do we need to learn a particular topic, a particular subject, or should I be in, into that domain? What's the big deal about it? Now, it is not my statistic. This is the statistics coming from some big house, from Gartner Group, okay? So they have found out they are a very reliable. They are very revered in the, in the industry for their analysis of the the trends, the job market, and everything. And they had found found out the maximum salaries that is being drawn are with through CEOs, CIOs, and CTOs. Of course, these are positions we are not 
aiming at right at this moment. Are we? No. CEO of a company, CIO, okay, and CTOs. But at least we can aim to be system architects, cyber security and DevOps engineers, DevSecOps engineers, cloud architects, and importantly, DevOps engineer. Because the salary that we are looking into uh, is what is my motivation, which drives me through. And if you look at this chart, these are rank between 1 to 30, and you will find a developer. Can you see a developer, web developer? It was huge demand at least 10 years back. But now the demand has, or the salary, because the salary is directly related to the demand. And you see the demand has fallen by 11.8 per, uh, percent. Whereas you look into a new, uh, a fresh sort of a domain, not even 10 years, or you can say it's a 10 year old domain. So there is an ample opportunity for you to grab it. So when the, the fruit is uh, fresh, then only you eat it. If the fruit, the fruit becomes stale, uh, definitely you will not eat it. So in this, DevOps engineer, it is ranking ninth, and it is a survey done from 2021 till date. And what we are seeing that there is a there is an increment. What it started with now it is almost 14.1 percent more. Okay, you cannot you cannot be a CEO, CIO, CTO, solution architect. It needs a lot of experience at least seven to eight years of experience we will not have that right at this moment principal software engineer they are drawing a lot of money okay but uh, that also takes a lot of experience system architect you need a lot of technical background behind you cyber security and DevSecOps engineer and architect it is also a very good domain you can graduate but unless and until you go for devops i mean that topic you will not be able to you can directly go into this but it will be very difficult to pick up because most of the companies have adopted devops and if you have to secure your devops processes and automation tools you have to learn this particular cyber security and DevSecOps. okay so go for this you have a good salary which is also it is ever increasing then aim for DevSecOps and cybersecurity. You can also go for data engineering. But uh, OK, so let us go ahead. You can see so uh, Mr. Devashish, I do have a yeah. small question for you. So now okay. as the AI is emerging in the market and uh, even few uh, months or weeks before that NVIDIA CEOs already uh, uh, publicly announced that uh, AI will replace the uh, IT market job. So mm -hmm. this, if the AI uh, is growing bigger compared to today's market uh, capacity, will it replace DevOps and the cybersecurity position as well? There is an ample chance. So, uh, no, see, uh, Dev, DevSecOps and cybersecurity, they are they, 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 there is there is no replacement for it. Even if you implement any system automation things with uh, AI, but still the security part is very much relevant. OK, so it cannot be. See, AI can then in that case, AI will be replacing everything. Artificial intelligence will be repla can replace anything, but artificial intelligence has to be very intelligently and government knows that. Any government, any country's government knows that it is not to be implemented everywhere. OK, okay. the artificial intelligence has this impact or application in a particular area, mostly in the health sector. If it is uh, prudently used, that it will uh, reap the benefits, but it can kill the market if it is uh, in, in the, uh, judiciously explored or implemented everywhere. So DevOps. DevOps engineering, DevOps, uh, I mean that uh, security, DevSecOps, all these have its own place. 
it will take a lot of time and because of the government's uh, attitude and particular implementation everywhere in europe also they have started banning yes the use of chat gpt and open ai they have put a ban yes uh, did i answer your question Sorry. yes 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 thank you thank you yeah so don't get uh, panicky yeah so uh, the, the, there is a frankenstein in the making but that is also a frankenstein so it is uh -huh. to be uh, to be understood so don't worry about that get yourself groomed into a domain where it, it will be easier for you to enter scale, scale up yourself scale up yourself and face the threat that is what my suggestion would be but again uh, the, uh, what my thought was uh, devops cyber security and data engineering itself because data engineering is a part of ai is much more uh, resilient uh, of ai compared to testing domain and uh, development domain am i right uh, yeah Th those are the very uh, you know vulnerable vulnerable areas with respect to ai they will not be able to cope up if i may use that term okay so development uh, your thing so that that is one of the reasons you know people are companies are not, are, are, when i'm saying people pe people means the companies uh, in india and all over the world they are also looking into one more aspect of devops after you have learned devops implemented devops in your company they are going for site reliability engineering which is called sre and since the market demand is slowly gradually coming up for sre engineers what we are also planning uh, that is an announcement of uh, of course uh, within very short time we are going to introduce sre as well because those who have learned devops cannot avoid and cannot just go away uh, without learning sre there are many other aspects of um, but basically you have to go for devops because from devops you will go into the networking uh, server uh, service mesh you know gitops and then you have the argo cd the deployment tools then monitoring tools and in overall you need to have your um, uh, analytics very well done through the logs so you need to have that sre know how as well so these you you see dev devops dev secops uh, data engineering as well as the sre these four form a very com uh, i mean formidable you alliance against your ai you have to fight out is that fine mr menon can we proceed yes hello yeah. yes yes so see uh, the ranking the skill the tool uh, that uh, you need to know it ranks top docker ansible Uh, your uh, one cloud in uh, the knowledge like azure or aws elastic search elastic search is your part of the sre jenkins now jenkins will be replaced by gitlab uh, jira will be included within the gitlab so so these are the things that we are going to uh, make you an expert on i i will not go into i i think i have enough see one, one thing i will tell you uh, 67% of the software development this is coming from indeed okay not uh, from kalki this statistics and all those stuff soft 60% of the software development teams that is software development organizations have adopted devops agile and scrum out of this 67% 18% of them has fully highly evolved implementation of devops that means this 18% of companies will not be able to take you why because they will need a very highly skillful devops guy because they have already uh, evolved they are in a very good level of uh, implementation of devops but so leaving 18 18% almost 82% of this of this industry who has adopted devops but they have not attained the highly evolved there is your huge demand so 82% of this 67% of this market 
So you are looking at 30 billion dollar market within 2028. You are already into that phase, 2022 to 2028. It's a huge demand. And this is considering the threat of AI. So Mr. Menon, did I answer? I mean, this is the statistics. You cannot, uh, I mean, yes, we, yes, we yes, cannot yes. Null nullify this. Yes. So these are all considering the threat of AI and how AI can eat up the entire job. But that is not true because this is going to grow. 30 billion in, uh, dollar in industry. It is not a mere thing. And you can also see the trend. Trend is, it is, of course, it is, it has been up to 2024. But can you see the blue line? Blue line is for DevOps. It is ever rising and the, it is ending up in a high, high note. It is going up, up. Even the cloud, the use of cloud is slightly bending down. And after 2024, it is going to be in a, in a very straight line. So the demand will not rise that uh, high, but it will be on a very, it, there will be a demand, but in a very lateral, I mean that it's a flat, flat demand. Whereas you think of other things like the microservices, Java, this is going to steadily rise because the world is towards microservices. Okay, let us move on. I will not go into deeper levels. You all know about uh, the software development lifecycle. If you have any questions in the meantime, please let me know because uh, we have to cover a lot of things. I can shortly briefly go over it. We have a planning. We are defining the, the requirements, and then designing. We have to design the solution. Then we come to the building, which is the development part. Then we put that into the testing to test whether the development is okay. And then we finally deploy it. All these things happen in a very planned manner, with a very uh, cohesive manner, you know? So that is called the software development life cycle. Now, why we are coming, we are going to understand why you are discussing this. In this software development life cycle, we had two models, the waterfall model and the agile model. I will not go into details of these two models, but yes, waterfall model has been replaced by agile model because of some important Defic uh, deficiencies or demerits of this particular model, which was absolutely overcome with the Agile model. And remember one thing, with Agile model came the DevOps methodology. DevOps cannot survive without Agile, and Agile cannot survive without or implemented without DevOps. So they are hand in gloves. Why the waterfall model fails? is because of its very rigid approach. It has a basic assumption that I will not fail. Everything what I do is perfect. It is a happy planning. It's a happy planning, optimistic planning. This optimism does not work in practical way. So there is no backward movement. That means it is not a cyclic manner. You cannot go back. Sort of it is very, very difficult to go back because once it is done with the assumption that everything was done correctly at this phase. So I will proceed, 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 proceed. Yeah, there are many ways to proceed uh, with every approval and there are so many steps. But the basic assumption is that we are going to succeed and that assumption is faulty. Most of the projects fail at this testing level, deployment level. The, the waterfall model and it has to go back again. This requirements cannot change. That is one more drawback. See, it's a one year project and within the one year project. If if the requirements do not change, then what means that the market is one year old and when you prepare a faultless product, if I can assume that generally it is not, but suppose uh, the product was fantastic. It went to the market after one year when the requirements were floated in. Within this one year, the market has matured. The demands have changed. The, uh, the, uh, the customer profiles have changed. So when you put a product after one year into the market, the product is obsolete. 
because your requirements were frozen. So there, there, there were lots of drawbacks, but yeah. But it was, I'm not saying that this was the this was the only tool available with the with the project managers and with the project team earlier, almost say 15 years back or 10 years back, you can say. Now came the agile model. You see a cycle and a handshaking between each and every uh, phase. The same, the requirements and design, everything was there, but but you see they are working together as a team, well-oiled machine, and each one testing is starting on the day one, coding is starting uh, along with the design. When the, the, the a bit of small bit of code is released every day to the testing team. So whatever you fail with assumption that I should not be failing at the end, in the end, we should fail in the beginning. That is the whole motto. You should fail uh, when you are in standard four or fa uh, standard five, but you should not be failing when you are attaining plus two or high school. If you fail at them, then, then your entire process has failed. So that is the motto. You should fail early to be successful in the end. Correct? That is called agile. There are lots of things into agile. I'm not going to the uh, perfect details, but with this model adopted by the industry came DevOps. Customer satisfaction, less planning required. Requirements can be dynamic and frozen functionality. So requirements are always dynamic. It keeps on changing. It keeps on adapting. The requirements keeps on. It's a very dynamic requirement. It depends on the market. You pick up the best uh, and the best feed requirements at that point of time. Which has a business value deliver them. Don't take time one year. Take one month to deliver, say, uh, 20 features. 20 good features of business value. And the functionality can be created. So all these things are because of agile model. Oh, why then DevOps? So this is the developers and the operations team. They are the two most, the pillars of an organization, of a software company, an IT company, you can say, or any company who has an IT department. They will have developers, they will have operations team. And of course, this operations team will also have the quality assurance team where you have the testing team. But can you see this picture? There is a fight. This fight is perennial, ever going, growing, uh, ever going, ongoing. It used to be because the developers do not accept their mistake and operations team will not accept their mistakes. Because they are the backbone of the company. Why? Because all the production systems, all the important systems are under their supervision. They are the most important guys in the organization. Can you understand that? So they will not take any garbage from the developers. Developers are quality guys. They are very good guys. I'm not saying they are not good. They, but they, have a tendency to somehow close the project, close the development cycle. And that is one thing that they will oppose. And there is a continuous fight and you understand that. There will be a lot of time taken between the developers and because every project is very stringent on the timelines, you know. You cannot say that I will have my own timelines. No, it is what the timelines have been decided with the project. The budget will depend on the timelines. The quality will depend on the timelines. You cannot keep going and going and going. There is a finite boundary between when the project starts and when the project ends. So, but this fight, continuous fight, acceptance and uh, resistance will keep on delaying the project. Then you stepped in with a lot of suit of tools called DevOps tools. Now, a developer can argue with an operations guy or a testing guy saying that, see, I am a, I'm a very experienced guy. I'm a eight years old in the industry. I am, 
uh, I know lots of things more than you. A testing guy, poor guy who has joined only one year, one year experience cannot fight with this guy because they have a lot of, you know, uh, credibility uh, carrying with them. So people, uh, they are go to guys. So people don't uh, uh, protest or they, they, they don't fight against these guys. But but these guys are also not flawless. They uh, have a lot of flaws. So what they do, what I have to do, I have to prove as a DevOps guy, I will come as a friend between the operations and dev. So this is dev and ops. I am a bridge. I will gap. I will bridge that gap between the developers and the operations having a suite of uh, tools and these are automation tools. These tools do not give a result which can be challenged by the developers or the operations guy or the testing guy. So now something coming from the tool, if they say that your code is faulty, this is not according to the standard practice or your uh, the code is not functionally working according to the requirement, then the developers cannot fight against that. They can, can, can it fight? No. So you have to come up with the tools as a solution to that problem of a fight between the developers and the operations. Clear? That is why DevOps is so important because it is changing the way, the culture of uh, any company, the way it used to work. Now it has created a very uh, friendly environment between the two. So they are working hand in hand. They are not fighting with each other because they are as if this is every other. It's a well oiled, well oiled engine. It works very smooth. So Amazon has also said uh, it's a very important thing. DevOps is a methodology as well as a mindset. It is a mindset. See, smallest of the smallest of your manual activity should be automatized. Now, what is the mindset? What is that big thing about the mindset? Mindset of an operations guy coming every day into the office and doing same sort of silo job again and again and again. So he knows I have to start with the uh, job A. I will run that. Job B, run that. After job A has completed, there is a scheduler. So every day the same sort of activity. One, one day that guy will get no challenges. So if there is no challenges, he is actually wasting his mm, himself into this particular process because there is no new activity that he is going to do. So what is happening? This mindset has to change. And now with if that that same operation guy is using some tool, DevOps tool, through which he can monitor something automatically without uh, much of an effort. Isn't it good? And he's yielding the productivity of that guy has increased. That is that is the, the thing that is DevOps is not only a methodology, it is a mindset and it is a term by Amazon. It is not uh, I'm saying. So customer centric actions, end to end responsibility, continuous improvement, automate everything. Even a smallest piece of activity should be automated. You should not leave it anything manual. That is the mindset. Work as one team, monitor and test everything. If you can follow all these six principles. You are a DevOps guy. Anyone is a DevOps guy. The, uh, the operations guy who was following this becomes a DevOps guy. A testing guy who is following this becomes a DevOps guy. A development guy who is following this will become a DevOps guy. Apart from you, you are purely an operation uh, DevOps guy. Traditional IT DevOps, I, I have. I think we know the difference. See, the DevOps tools are going to enforce that DevOps methodology. DevOps itself is not a tool. It's a methodology. So that methodology will be enforced by having few tools. 
each and every facet of software development will have one tool, one or more than one tool. What are the things then? There are 20 plus DevOps tools, very important tools for you to learn. If you have to stand a good firm standing into, into the DevOps world, what are the things that you need to learn? We have found out with the market survey that our Kalki or continual, continuously does, we have industry experts in our domain, in our company, who keeps us giving feedback. What is the trend? What is the companies looking for? So we have designed whatever is important for you to learn, to sustain, to survive in this industry, to first of all, get a job and sustain that job. So we are going to learn infrastructure as a code, which is Terraform. We are going to learn build tool like Maven or Gradle, version control tool like your Git and the GitHub. Then the container management tool like Docker, Kubernetes. OK. Uh, we are not going to learn right now because in the DevOps course, we have not uh, having anything on the monitoring thing, but when we are introducing SRE, okay, site reliability engineering, this is a huge demand. This is coming up, so be aware. This is an awareness program, so we understand that there is a huge demand coming up for SRE, at least in US and India market. See, see again the deployment server monitoring. This will again come under SRE. Configuration management comes under DevOps, particularly like Ansible, we are going to learn. Then in the deployment automation, we will learn Git, GitLab because Jen, Jenkins, we are, Jenkins has fallen, fallen a bit behind GitLab. So we have adopted GitLab's, GitLab. So all these things are there. Uh, this is the cycle, you know, uh, the plan, the coding, the building, the testing deploy operate can you see there are few pipelines going between all of these phases and there are particular tools for each of these phases so these are the, the devops tools we are learning gitlab gitlab will will take care of uh, jira git is the technology for uh, with the developers and the devops guys because that is where they will store the source code and do the version version control part of the coding. OK, then the build. Maven, Maven build. OK, for the testing tool, there is there is Selenium, you, uh, you know, J unit and Selenium. These are the tools for automation in testing. Then there's the deploy. So for automation of the deployment, you need a doc, Docker containerization vagrant or a puppet okay so you learn docker in the operate you learn terraform and ansible and in this monitoring we are not introducing anything in the monitoring for the devops pure devops course but uh, we are going to do that for it's a it's a coming up very very important uh, that is the elk this is part of your sre So these are very important tools that you need to learn. Kubernetes, GitLab, Nagios. Nagios comes within SRE. Terraform, Git, Docker, Ansible. We had already covered the awareness for Terraform, Git, uh, Ansible. AWS, see AWS and your knowledge of Linux is the must. You cannot learn DevOps without uh, knowing about AWS is the cloud, any cloud, and of course, Linux. So the Git is for the continuous development. Uh, GitLab is for the continuous integration and the continuous integration and deployment pipelines. The Docker, the Puppet, Ansible, these are for the continuous deployment, part of the continuous deployment. Selenium is part of the continuous testing. These are all DevOps tools. Nagios is for continuous monitoring. And if you see the overall picture of a DevOps lifecycle, 
starting with the developer and ending with the deployment into the production server or the testing server or the pre-production server is this. We are going to learn a lot in depth in our courses. Everywhere, few of the DevOps tools fit in, like Git. Developer from the developer, uh, developer puts something on the Git. Uh, from the pipeline, the Git lab will fetch those code into, into its domain. And then with the help of Docker, Terraform for provisioning, and with Ansible, they uh, with the Ansible, it will be able to deploy it to the testing server. OK, as a containerized image and the testing server, there was the testing with the Selenium will happen. If everything goes wrong, uh, sorry, right, every, everything goes wrong or something goes wrong, there will be a continuous feedback mechanism through the pipeline. It will go back to the developer. Developer will correct it again, put it back to Git and the cycle continues again and again, iterative. Finally, if everything goes fine, there will be an approval process. And then comes the. This is the delivery and this comes the deployment. So a continuous integration with GitLab, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. This is called the CICD. OK, so just to begin with uh, GitLab, I will tell you GitLab is a. Uh, CICD pipeline, that is the main utility uh, use of this is a CICD pipeline tool, a pipeline uh, automation tool, you know. Uh, it is CICD, you know, uh, continuous integration and continuous de delivery and deployment, as we were discussing earlier with DevOps. So this tool is a web-based Git repository that provides free and open private repositories. OK. It has a whole suite of things. It is not only a Git repository. It is not a substitute or GitHub only. We, as we proceed, we will understand that it is a complete DevOps platform. That is, if you have GitLab, you are mostly having everything. Which is required for a DevOps platform or a DevOps lifecycle to be executed. You have this major platform called GitLab. And on top of it, you have Terraform, Ansible, you name it. AWS, AWS CLI, uh, Docker, Kubernetes. So it is one of the base platform on which every other day, and not only uh, the DevOps platform, it is, it is also going to substitute Jira. Jira is a project management tool. OK? Uh, I mean, GitLab replaces Jira. GitLab replaces Jenkins. GitLab replaces GitHub. What else a company would like to uh, know or uh, adopt to? The best. I don't have to license for uh, separate separate tools. And you know, if you have to have all those, you have to have expertise or uh, specialists on those tools. The knowledge base can differ. Difficult to get all these people assembled together and work together as so a person knowing GitLab knows each and every part of it. It is a complete DevOps platform that enables professionals to perform all the tasks in a project. You see the highlight is the project. As if you are doing a DevOps project or a project. Starting from planning and source code management to monitoring and security. So it's a complete life cycle, starting with uh, Git, starting with the version control, ending with the monitoring tool called Nagios or any, any uh, Splunk or implementing SRE. So it is a complete suit. It was commercially released on 2014. OK. It encompasses the entire DevOps lifecycle SDLC as known as ideation to production. Ideation means start of an idea, start of the requirement. And convert that requirement into. A product into the production. So from ideation to production, everything, whatever you need, 
will be available with GitLab. Like you can have the issues and issue boards. There can be Kanban boards or a Scrum board. You know, Agile. So you can go for an Agile project just by managing those Agile, whatever the, the Agile principles and Agile uh, elements or components. You can have the code reviews. That is one big, see, the code review could be done separately with Sonar Cube. Sonar Cube is a code quality checker. Okay, but you can also do the same activity with, you know, code review. So one tool replacing multiple tools. Continuous integration, automated build and test. Continuous delivery and deployment, which is called the CD. CI is continuous integration and container registry. OK, you don't want to go for Docker Hub because Docker Hub is a public repository where you store the images, the Docker images or uh, images. Here you give the GitLab is giving you the container registry. Container means your a place when we learn Docker in the next session, we are going to have an overview of Docker. We will understand what is container. And we store the images inside the container. OK, so that will be be available as a registry over in GitLab. You do not see the main thing is you do not need to go anywhere else as if you are entering a department store and you get ev everything starting from your rice. To your uh, dresses or to your crockeries kitchenware or electronics electronics items everything in one house you do not need to go shop around so we are going to look into the basic ci cd pipeline what is a pipeline uh, automation pipeline gitlab architecture basic concepts of gitlab ci cd and also we are going to learn the following how the GitLab CI CD works if possible. See, it's a very short time, but we are going to have a very good overview. And what are the main building blocks? So GitLab strives to become a complete DevOps platform. And in that strive, it has almost completed its objective. It is one tool having everything. Mm. Hello. Any question? It is a platform on which you build your complete DevOps workflows. And so if you see this is GitLab, this is the logo of GitLab. It is already gaining a stature of a DevOps platform. People have started using this as a DevOps platform where you start working with other tools, integrating all, all the other tools available in the market. It can manage, manage your code, the code which is coming from the developers. What is that? It is like a GitHub. So you do not need to go to purchase a license for GitHub. OK, you do it over GitLab because GitLab gives all the GitHub features. The version control too. Plan. It is the part of Jira, you know. Like you can plan your project, so it is Jira that it is giving all the features of Jira. Create. You you are going to create something like uh, your uh, basically the pipeline. You are going to build your pipeline. That is the that is one thing that you have to do. The somebody was asking me about whether you can code. You can code. Can anybody, anybody tell me how can you code your infrastructure? We have already gone through that. If you can please attend somebody, any any guesswork. How do we code? What is the what is the tool through which we code our infrastructure that servers we create, the storage we create, the IEM user we create, the uh, you know, the networking we create, all the resources we create over the cloud. Can you tell me how do we code that infrastructure using which tool of DevOps? 
infrastructure as a code, uh, probably maybe Terraform something. Oh, fantastic. Great, great. It's a good, Terraform. good work. Terraform, yes, Terraform. So you say I code. Uh, so and, and and we have seen on a Terraform demonstration that the code is not the code of Python or Java or uh, PHP or something like uh, difficult ones. Simple HashiCorp lang language, so which are very simple scripts. You write and you you were able to deploy something or provision something on the infrastructure as an infrastructure. So, and if I ask you, if I ask you. How do you code your configuration? Can you tell me which tool will help you? You code your infrastructure with Terraform. I absolutely wonderful. What about you code your configuration? That means you want to install some software onto the platform that you have just now uh, delivered with Terraform. Let's say I want to install Apache. I want to install Nginx. I want to install Java. So which is a DevOps tool through which you can do that? Ansible. Ansible, Ansible, the configuration management tool. So you say I am coding the environment, uh, coding the configuration. Through coding of, see, so you write some small playbooks. Those playbooks are Ansible playbooks through which you can do some execute some job on some remote server. Like installing Java. Or installing your application. Configuring your user. Configuring the storage. So whatever you do configuration is through Ansible. So you say I'm coding the configuration. If I ask you. How do you code your pipeline? The pipeline that will operate between various tools to deliver the jobs or to have the pipeline jobs um, executed over the pipeline. You say I will use what? I am code, coding the pipeline. Some simple scripts to code the pipeline to make the pipeline automated. What do we say? Jenkins. Jenkins, fantastic, because Jenkins comes automatically to your mind because Jenkins is, Jenkins is very popular. GitLab is one of the tools similar to Jenkins and much more. So I can code a CI CD automation pipeline. Over. GitLab or over Jenkins. So they are called the integrators. Then within. After you have coded your pipeline, you have delivered the jobs or you have sequenced up the jobs that will be executed one after the other. The Terraform job, Ansible job, AWS CLI job, shell jobs. You need to verify your code, isn't it? How do you verify? You also use GitLab. And now everything has been done. Approval has been given. OK, you want to package it now. There was an approval from the uh, development team. OK, you, there was a peer to peer testing, peer testing or unit testing, you can say, and they have verified that the software that was created in the pipeline were working fine. Whatever the whatever the developer has put in into that pipeline is working fine. So now let us package this. So who will help? GitLab will help to package. Package means something like uh, you containerize it, isn't it? Your entire thing, you put an environment, uh, an abstraction layer on top of your image or top of your application, which is an image. So you package it. And next comes the question of your package. Now you are delivering from one platform to the other platform for testing. You want to release it. Before release, you have to ensure that your package is secured. Nobody can decrypt or nobody can uh, in between when you transport it or port it. Nobody can go and extract the data, confidential data from it. 
or can execute the application or hack your application. So you have to enable the security. Who will do that? Who that? Uh, who will do that? Help you to do that? Also, GitLab. Now you want to. You have packaged, and now you want to release it. Give some particular. You merge it. You merge from all the branches. You package it, and now you want to release it. Who will help you? GitLab. Now you want to configure it. OK. So maybe there is a, some requirement of configuring the uh, environment. On which your uh, your application will be hosted. So that configuration, who is going to help you in building up that environment again GitLab. Now finally it has been delivered or deployed into production. You have another a very important part is to constantly monitor, continuously monitor the health of the product that you have deployed onto production. Who is going to help you doing that? Again, GitLab. Okay. So you plan, you implement. Implement is develop and build. You test, package, release, observe, observe or monitor. All, all these aspects of uh, your pipeline or whatever you say as a software development lifecycle can be observed or can be implemented over GitLab. So it is not only a pipeline, automation pipeline. Jenkins only does a automation pipeline. Jenkins cannot help with planning, cannot help with versioning or uh, implementation, the, 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 whatever the implementation of the developer's source code, testing, packaging. So entire project can be handled over GitLab. That's the reason why GitLab has many built-in features or out-of-the-box features available for DevOps and IT projects. Many, many features. Once we start exploring, I mean, you can just appreciate. And also the core, yes, of course, you can say, what is the core of that product? What is the heart of the product? The heart of GitLab is, of course, CI CD pipeline. CI means continuous integration, continuous deployment, or continuous delivery. So what do we do as an overall? GitLab will execute the pipeline that you have configured. We are con coding the pipeline, isn't it? We are going to code a pipeline with the help of GitLab script. And to release new code changes to the end user, we are going to deploy it to the end user, into the production or pre-production, whatever. So the developer, will merge the code that it has he or she has developed from the various branches into one main branch and put it into some uh, maybe in, in into a master branch of the remote git repository and it will be released for test for testing if the testing is fine, then you will go for the final build and packaging. And whatever the build, uh, what, whatever the output of the build, you always have to store it in an artifact repository. See, as I was, uh, I was telling you, discussing that 18% of that 65% of the industry who has adopted DevOps, out of that 18% has evolved into a full-fledged DevOps house they will always go for artifact repository. Let's say one example is Nexus. Where you store all the artifacts for future reference or maybe a rollback, there is always a possibility that when you deploy into the production and something goes wrong, you have to go back to the previous artifact and go back to the developer they will again start uh, uh, rectifying whatever the issues, put it in the version control, again test, again build, again put that, <coughs> that version 
artifactory into that repository. Nexus. And deploy it. So all these things happens in a very uh, well um, uh, organized manner. So CICD stands for continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery. And what it basically means is automatically and continuously testing, building and releasing code changes to the deployment. You understand all these terms. The same thing. <clears throat> Just to explore <clears throat> what is CI and what is CD. What is continuous integration? You continuously integrate your code, the code coming from the developer into the GitLab pipeline, building the, this thing. So up to this stage where you build and package is called the continuous integration. And whenever after you have put that into the repository, after that, for security purpose, that means for uh, you can always go back to this artifactory and get back your build and package and unpack it like you are gift, gifting something in a, into a beautiful package. Then somebody who whom you have gifted will unpack it. Similarly, here also you can do the packing and unpacking. Deploy to the dev. So here comes starting starting from here is the continuous delivery or deployment. You deploy to the dev environment, deploy to the staging environment, which is a pre-production environment, or finally you deploy to the production. You are launching the product. So that means when a developer commits a new code into the GitLab repository, see, I am not using GitHub repository. As I told you, GitLab has replaced GitHub. You can do whatever GitHub can do, you can do it similarly on the GitLab. So you have a GitLab repository. GitLab will automatically execute a CI CD pipeline. I have a small demo for you to for you to comprehend the power of GitLab. But let's see if I can get some time. You, uh, you have configured for your project to release those code changes to the end environment where the end users can access them. That is the ultimate objective. There are many competing brands to uh, a CI CD pipeline. Somebody was asking, uh, somebody mentioning that there is Azure pipelines. There is Jenkins. There is Team City. There is Travis CI. There is also from the AWS house that is the cloud. Like uh, from Azure is a cloud. Azure comes with Azure pipelines as a service for implementing an automatic CI CD pipeline. Similarly, AWS will come with code pipeline. It is also very popular, but for that you need to go for AWS. You have to go for this AWS cloud. This is a proprietary like Azure pipelines is a proprietary of Azure. Similarly, uh, code pipeline AWS code pipeline is a proprietary of. AWS cloud. But GitLab stands tall among all of this. Why? Advantage of GitLab. We have we have been discussing the advantages of GitLab. It is replacing so many other tools in one house. In one department store, you are getting everything. So your team is actually already working with GitLab. You have your code there, so your all the source code is already available on the GitLab repository. So why to go here and there? So if you have built a project over the GitLab, everything is available on the GitLab. You do not need to go for Jira for extra uh, project management tools to get. You get it on GitLab. So this is basically an additional feature that you can extend your workflows on GitLab with with and you don't need a separate tool for that. So why a company will will spend additional money in procuring Azure pipelines? If you have GitLab. You do not need to go for Jenkins. Or for this thing, you do not need to go for Jira. You do not need to go for GitHub because you see everything is comes with a price. Nothing is free. 
you do not need to go for a code uh, quality check like uh, Sonar Cube. It is available with GitLab. So you get started without any setup effort. Now, the one best thing about GitLab is if you have used Jenkins, you will know it's a bit. Maybe you are not finding it difficult, but for a fresher, for somebody who is using Jenkins uh, very new, it is quite tough to create a cluster. And keep the Jenkins uh, nodes. Uh, working together. And on top of that, you have to create the pipeline environment. It is not a simple task. Whereas everything is built for you in the in the in the GitLab. You do not have to have a requisite knowledge of setting up the pipeline. Pipeline is already there. You use it. As I was saying. Somebody does how and somebody does what? You in GitLab is a perfect DevOps tool. You know why? Because they only let you focus on the what part, what, not the how. Jenkins will force you to create. So you need to know the how, how part it, how part of it. Okay, but I'm not saying Jenkins is not popular. Jenkins is still very popular. But GitLab is capturing the market. Now, as somebody was asking, I think Mr. Menon was asking why we why my industry expert has suggested me to adopt GitLab for my training course schedule. We were we were teaching, we were <coughs> delivering the courses on Jenkins initially with uh, almost 30 batches that we had already uh, 34 batches. Sorry, with the 35th batch, we introduced GitLab. Because that was the right time to introduce GitLab because our students would be facing interviews and people have started asking less on Jenkins, more on GitLab. Because whatever the concept, you see, the pipeline concept remains the same. Technology does not change. Only if you have learned GitLab well, you can cover Jenkins, you can cover Jira. You can cover uh, Sonar Cube. You can cover uh, Git, GitHub. Everything. Seamless integration into code repository. So your code repository is hosted over GitLab. You do not need to go run here and there. And running here and there, you know, many developers find it quite uh, disturbing. Not only disturbing, then it is very error prone. You can miss out. From that repository to this, you may miss out something or there is some audit problem. OK. No, nothing, no need to worry about that. You have a seamless integration of your code repository. Using CI CD without overhead setting it up, you do not need to set up the CI CD pipeline. But whereas in Jenkins, Jenkins is only a CI CD tool, it is nothing else. But it's a very good CI CD tool. I will not say it is not. It is very good, but it is only a CI CD tool. Pipeline configuration as a part of your application code in CI CD, you have to set it up fully. Here also you have an advantage. You do not need to set up pipeline configuration as a part of your application code. Now here is the important thing. You do every configuration as a code. And that is very simple. Whereas you have to set up the entire environment yourself. Not as a part of code, so there are man, many manual activity into it. And finally, when it comes to automation, you create again a complicated Jenkins pipeline script. Because Jenkins is entirely based on plugins. And you have to know the working of each and every particular plugin. Whereas Let's say you are working with Jenkins for a Terraform plugin or Ansible plugin. You have to know those plugins well, how to work with them. Here you do not need. You need to know Terraform. You need to know Ansible. That is that is also new. 
have to. So you are writing the Terraform uh, scripts. You do not need to change anything for that Terraform. You just put it as a job. That's all. It is also self-hosted or SaaS software as a service. It's a big facility. You can leave it on everything for security, for availability, for uh, monitoring purpose. So verif ver verification purpose, everything for secrecy, security, everything will be managed by GitLab. This is self-hosting is the only option. It is not managed. Jenkins. So a GitLab architecture. GitLab architecture. If you say now, now the question comes in your mind, in your intelligent mind is that if GitLab is doing me everything, giving me everything. Basically, how does it actually work? Isn't that one question hammering you? So we must understand the GitLab architecture. It is a very simple architecture. But see, on the surface, if you see something very simple, you must understand the technology inside is very complicated. But on the surface, if it is simple, let it be simple. I would like to work on that simple, simplified layer which has been given or presented to me by GitLab. Why to worry about what is the complicated architecture or the engine behind giving us that simplified view? If I uh, if I'm going to work in an IT industry, I will not make my life complicated as it is. My life is already complicated. Why to worry about uh, something which has already been done for you? Take advantage of it. So GitLab architecture is providing you that facility that you simply work on it. I have set it everything for you. I have a GitLab instance and that is the beauty that you do not need to create a server because if you want to install Jenkins, you have to install Jenkins on a server. You have to install the Jenkins nodes. You have to connect those nodes over some Gen Jenkins agent working on those nodes. This is quite complicated boss. I will not go for that complicated architecture. I will say GitLab provides me with that some somewhere in the cloud. Somewhere there is a server maintained by GitLab. It is not your headache. You create one account. That's all that you need. You need how simple how life can be simpler. That is our objective and GitLab says boss. Debashish, you do not need to worry. You just simply create an account with me. I rest. I will take care. I will give you the storage. I will give you the repository. I will give you the processing. Whatever you need, how much speed you need, how much uh, security you need, how much maintainability you need. I will give everything, all the resources for you. Just use it. Be happy. OK. So that GitLab magical instance is hosting your application code and your pipelines and basically the whole configuration. So why not? Every organization is accepting this facility, this uh, simplicity, this uh, beauty, you know, this power. It is saving a lot of their cost. And what a company looks, what, what, what does a, a, a organization will look into that? I will save my cost. Why shall I invest on technology? I will invest on my manpower, quality manpower. Who can operate on this? That's all. I do not need to invest. Technology itself is going to change every day. I will not invest. Keep on investing on technology. Today, this becomes obsolete. Tomorrow, that becomes obsolete. How much I can push in a capital investment on this? No, I will not. If somebody is helping me with this, let's go with that. Uh, anybody wants to ask anything? Is there any doubt in that philosophy of GitLab? You are a friend between the development team and the operations team, testing team, quality assurance team. 
and GitLab is pro making you a friend by providing with such a powerful tool. OK. GitLab runners. These are runners which are simple things. In Jenkins, you have to ex you have to implement that executor. Through the plugins for each of them, there will be some executors. OK, for that uh, for uh, the pipeline here also, you have to have some executor and we say these are GitLab runners. Which will run the job on the pipeline, so on the pipeline, you will have job one, job two, job three, job four, n number of jobs. It will be sequentially or parallelly run. It can be uh, so you. Yeah, 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 Mr. Devashish, I think uh, one question uh, I, we have that. Uh, Rajneet uh, asked GitLab is free yeah. or it is a uh, paid services and I do have a uh, one more question that uh, as we are uh, have like a very few minutes left. We are at the end of our sessions kind of but do you have any opportunity to see the GitLab a little bit hands on or the uh, interface? So this question is from my side and uh, Rajneet has a question that uh, is it free service or it's a paid service? OK. Rajit, uh, what would you like to have? Uh, something if you learn free, will you go no, no, for it, it? Because no, he is asking about the GitLab services. GitLab service, that is what I'm saying. So, uh, Rajit, Rajit, is it right? Yeah. No, Rajit, uh, for Ranjit. Ranjit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rajit, uh, see, for for learning, these are all open source softwares. All the services you get from GitLab are free for you to use. You can build your project. Oh, wow. OK, so you don't have to spend a cent. Or one rupee on on it while you learn. Yeah, you learn it very well. GitLab is saying that please learn that technology very well. OK, then get a job. Now let wow. the company get the enterprise version. Because if you want to launch a product or, or to deliver a product commercially, I will not allow because that is uh, against the norms that you if you have a free thing and you try to deliver it onto the commercial, then then there is a illegal thing. So your company is not going to do illegal things, but let your company pay for those services that I provide as a GitLab. So let the company buy the enterprise version. But when you learn, you learn it on open source. All the features available on enterprise will be available on the open source. So learn it free. And when you get a job, you you are get paid. Let company pay for my services, my GitLab services. So correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. uh, if I uh, present in other way, so individual services, but so GitLab for individual is free. But GitLab Enterprise for the in, uh, uh, companies or uh, yes. big brands, it is paid services for them, right? It's paid, paid services. Paid services. OK, uh, and your question was uh, uh, how do I As manage within this short time? Uh, I also am in mean, a bit of a dilemma uh, whether I will be able to show you, but I've been trying. If you can give me uh, some some more time, uh, I will try to finish it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what I can do because I thought I will go through some quizzes. OK, and maybe the demo part that 15 minutes, 20 minutes, what I have, I, I can devote it on my uh, next session before I start with Docker. Will that be fine with all of you? Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, because you see uh, there is no hurry. We will see a demo on GitLab. If, if let's see how we proceed. Uh, let me continue. I, I think we can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. So you see a beautiful picture coming in front of you is the GitLab architecture, but do you see it's complicated? I don't think so. If you had seen the Git, uh, Jenkins architecture, you can compare how simple this one is because every of the services are hosted by the GitLab instance. 
internal services that will make your pipeline work. You have to write a script and make provision for the jobs. You configure one job or two job or n number of jobs. This is a pipeline. And this pipeline will be executed by a runner. A runner is running on a host. It can be a Linux host. It can be a Windows host or it can be a Mac host. But generally, a company, uh, a good organization will always go for a good host, which is a Linux host, a powerful host. Why? Because you might be uh, running parallel jobs and you might be running multiple runners or you, there can be a case where you are running multiple runners on multiple hosts. That is also fine. In Jenkins, if you had to implement this architecture, it would be very complicated. Quite complicated because in Jenkins, one pipeline, you have to configure it with a lot of hard work. And it is not guaranteed that it will work. If you are an expert, yes, it will of course work. It works very nice. But here, you do not need to do anything. What you need to concentrate on or focus on the script, pipeline script. That's all. So your runner will be automatically uh, assigned to your project, which is running the pipeline. Uh, I will. Uh, I, I think in the next day, uh, in the next session, I can demo that part. I have created a demo for you. How simple it is and how powerful it is to execute a GitLab uh, runner project. A uh, GitLab GitLab project, project a DevOps project. Okay. So multiple runners can be run on multiple hosts, or multiple runners can be on single host. Multiple pipelines can work on a single host, or multiple pipelines or distributed pipelines can work on distributed host. You just need one GitLab instance. You host your project on it. Or that instance is nothing but a GitLab server somewhere on the cloud. And you do not need to pay for this server. You just have to create an account for it. One GitLab instance will be allocated for you. Uh, GitLab runners are the agents that you run your CI CD jobs for. These are some agents which needs to pick up the job and execute the job because you see the job is nothing but your application. You are running some application. Uh, do you think it's an application? You are running some application A, application B, maybe a Python application, maybe uh, on the first job. Then there is a Java application on the second job. So some output from Python goes to the Java. Java then processes it, gives to the next output, uh, next job, which may be a very simple shell script. So it is up to the application that is being designed, but you as a DevOps engineer, you have designed the pipeline. You have designed the pipeline script. And your installed GitLab runner will pick up the job one after the other. And because your jobs are nothing but applications running inside the container. And what is container? It is Docker. Docker is one engine which will enable that. Uh, uh, so a runner will execute that Docker job. GitLab server assigns pipeline jobs to the available runners. So you have to assign it. All these things are there. We so manage SaaS versus self-managed. See, in an organization, they are see this one part. As I told you, I in, in my AWS session, we were uh, we were, we were learning about your platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and software as a service. So software as a service is everything you have given it to your cloud provider. They will manage even your application, even your data. Similarly, you can get a SaaS version of GitLab. That is the entire enterprise version. If your company wants, everything will be managed by GitLab. All the services, it will be taken from GitLab. It is fine. But there are many medium sized companies, many small size companies. They want self managed. 
uh, organization. So you manage the runners fully from your own, for, from your side, and that is my preferred configuration. Why should I give everything to GitLab? Because then the basically you are saving your cost. And why a company has hired you? You know GitLab. So the company is indirectly saying that please save me of that cost of uh, giving everything to GitLab because GitLab is going to charge me. So I'm hiring you. Please help us to set up our self-managed runners. And you won't believe me. I don't know why GitLab has given such a facility because they are losing their business of getting into the managed. They could have easily, but that is the beauty of a, a powerful tool like that. You do not hide your technology. If you can provide a better technology, you give it. And that is what they have done. That's why it is gaining popularity that within. You have sacrificed your managed services in front of uh, this uh, self managed runners. And you won't believe me. You can take it from me. You can easily set up your self-managed runner. So the company is only paying you not to GitLab. That's good. It's good for you. You know the technology, how to set up your own runner. That's all. So connect your GitLab, own GitLab runners, or set up your own GitLab instance. So this is called the self-managed. You are setting up everything by yourself. Or you are letting everything taken care by GitLab.com, the company, GitLab. Whereas you are setting your GitLab.mine. So you are setting up the project yourself, doing your self-managed runners. I will prefer this one. Because I'm going to save my company's money. Pipeline configuration, I will not go into very good part of it. But yes, you write a YAML file. And this is simple. Not at all complicated. If you compare Jenkins and Azure pipelines, they are quite complicated to write, to understand, to comprehend. The simple YAML format, you put everything into this and you, are, you have built your pipeline. You have coded your pipeline. That's it. You put it, your pipeline script, you put it in the root uh, root folder of the project repository. That's all that you need to do. That's all. All this is the configuration that you need to do. Nothing else. Everything is set up for you. And basically, you put it into the uh, project folder, the root folder. So the jobs are nothing but these are say one job is running the test, building the image, deploy something. So job one, job two, job three, job four. That is the CI CD pipeline. What you do, you write the GitLab CI.yaml file. That's all. So you are saying job one, script. You give some script to execute. Job two, script. You execute a script. That's all. Like a job could be by the name run tests. So run test <coughs> is one job. And so what is your command? Through the script, you say make test. Make test is on the command line. It's a make utility. You say make test. Like if you are building an image through Docker, what is your script? Your various commands are simple. You see. Docker login, you are logging into Docker. Docker hub, you are Docker build, so you are building an image. Then you are saying Docker push, you are putting it into the Docker hub. So by doing this, you are building an image. How simply? So who is running this job? Your GitLab runner is running this job, executing this job. Anyway, we are going to see that as a prepared demo then there is um, uh, you, uh, you can save your secret information you can mask your variables you can seek, uh, your sensitive data can be protected like passwords username personal access tokens project access tokens these are very secret information you do not want to divulge this with the other users because there can be lots of uh, 
company secrets. You, you see passwords. You cannot uh, part with this information with others. Username, access tokens. So you concentrate on the pipeline scripts. Secretive information, everything will be uh, used in the CI/CD environment by the GitLab, provided by GitLab. See, everything is provided by GitLab. You put those variables into secret with the secret information inside the GitLab environment, CI/CD environment. That's all. You mask it. So I have a hands on. I will just explain today. I will not go into the details because I think we are uh, over time. We are. On the next weekend, we are going to we will take half an hour, not even half an hour. I will take 15 minutes. OK, to. Prepare a demo of your GitLab. That what is done that there is. Terraform, I'm going to use Terraform jobs to be executed on a GitLab pipeline, CI CD pipeline. So I will see how automatically by least of effort, I will be provisioning some resources on my AWS cloud. Isn't it fantastic? I will just trigger some change somewhere in my uh, in my I will push some changes onto my GitLab repository. Immediately the pipeline will be triggered and immediately the jobs will start firing one after the other in a pipeline. So when you see your resource will be deployed before you uh, you execute your pipeline, it was the default VPC. I'm talking about the AWS VPC. I'm going to create a VPC of my own. Virtual private cloud, a network element. OK, now every region. This is the Mumbai region. This is my IM user DevOps internship. Remember, we have created this particular user uh, with administrative privilege in our AWS session. I think you uh, you remember. So uh, we are going to use this all this setup and this setup is going to just th there is an existing in the region. There is an existing. Default VPC. But we are going to create our. With the help of Terraform, we are going to validate. We are, these are the various jobs. These are the various stages. The, the one that I have highlighted with a red mark. These are the, the I have given the job name and the stage name the same. So these are the stages validate, then plan, then apply then destroy if everything goes fine. If the with the approval, I will destroy the resources that I have created. So what is there in the pipeline? The pipeline is validate job. Plan job, apply job, destroy job. So there are four jobs in the pipeline. First validate. There is a dependency between the plan and the validate. After the validation is over, these are all Terraform jobs. See, I'm using only one tool in the GitLab pipeline. That is Terraform. I'm going to provision a, a my individual VPC. I've created a provision after I've executed the pipeline. You see, it was earlier one default VPC. Now you have added your DevOps internship VPC. This is what I'm going to. We are going to demo in our next weekend session. Is that fine? Do you agree? Yeah, uh, I think um, that will be great. Just one last bit of thing. If you can, uh, if you can just to be uh, to make this interactive session a bit more interesting. So I have prepared few interview questions, which are basic questions, but these are the questions which through which the interview can judge your level of understanding of GitLab. So can anybody uh, try to attempt this? Any guess, any answer, good answer, bad answer, very good answer, very bad answer. Everything is an answer. How is GitLab different from GitHub? These are two different products, GitLab and Git GitHub. 
is there any difference so gitlab uh, gitlab comes with configuration of the pipelines but github does not have that very good one one of one very important i, I mean a very good attempt fantastic Anyone else with something else? OK, because we are running short of time. Let, uh, let, uh, let me try to answer that. So what is an ideal good answer? There is no good answer. You see, there is no correct answer. Uh, answer is more or less, this is a good answer if you think, because both GitHub and GitLab are version control systems. Both are version control system. You can use GitLab as a version control system. You can use it as a code repository, okay? Like GitHub, versioning control. It can be a bit difficult to choose one of the two. The most significant difference between the two is the GitHub primarily focus on collaboration and code review, whereas GitLab focuses on DevOps as well as continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. Somebody has given me the correct answer. I, I do not know her name, but thank you. Congratulations. You were you have just hit the right answer. Why GitLab is better than Jenkins? If can somebody we have already discussed that. Is that an interesting question? Yeah. I yeah, think Jenkins Jenkin is only used for CI CD. Why GitLab can be used both for CI CD and for an entire complete job in DevOps. Yeah. Fantastic. Again, good hand. So GitLab provides more than what Jenkins is hoping to evolve to. By providing a fully integrated single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. So GitLab has gone a, a quantum jump over uh, Jenkins. And that's why the market has been captured. More than Jenkins goals, GitLab over, uh, also provides planning, software code, uh, code management, that is uh, source code, uh, sorry, source code management, which is a versioning control like the GitHub. Packaging, release, configuration, monitoring, and what not. It is a planning tool like the Jira. It is a Git, GitHub tool. It is a packaging tool like uh, for a Maven. You do not need to use Maven. It, it can package for you. It can release. It can configure, monitor. So many things. Thank you. Is GitLab better than Jira? Now, this is a tricky question. Any attempt? Any any guess 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 what? I think Jira is also a very popular tool, but it is mostly based on the project management part of it. OK, let me. Show you the answer. Uh, it's a good answer is if you say while Jira is better, for mid sized teams who need specific things to be to test and track while developing code. OK, but GitLab is ideal for the largest teams. It can deal with a very, very large team. Out there who need features to improve their workflow. So Jira does not have a full development lifecycle features, whereas GitLab has. So a very large team, because it is very difficult to manage a large team, a mid-sized team, seven to nine persons working in a team is well managed by Jira from the project management perspective. But if you want to uh, manage a large team with many variety of requirements, then and to have all facets of that uh, cycle, life cycle, it is uh, better to go for GitLab. Why should I use GitLab? So it's a uh, sort of a, uh, you know, a broad question. The main benefit of using GitLab is that it allows all the team members to collaborate. This is a very important. Uh, if you can hit, see every question. Remember, please remember in an interview, an uh, interviewer is looking for your buzzword. If you may not, you may not have answered in a very correct manner. 
the way the uh, the interviewer would like. But if you can hit upon that particular word, you have scored. And what is the buzzword here? Collaboration. Because we want to collaborate with a large team. And can we get a better tool than GitLab? I don't think so. GitLab offers tracking from planning to creation, as we said, from ideation to production. To help developers automate the entire DevOps lifecycle and achieve the best possible results. Uh, do this answer. Uh, do you like this answer? Short to the point and hitting the buzzword. That is how you should face the interview. What is pipeline in GitLab? You know that. I will not go into. Uh, pipeline is a group of jobs that get executed in stages. All of the jobs in a stage are executed in parallel. Okay. The, the jobs can be executed in parallel. And if they all succeed, the pipelines move on to the next stage. But many companies would not like to execute in parallel. They would like to execute in sequence. So you can say parallel is one thing that many companies try to achieve. But the simplest one is the sequential one, which is non-parallel, which is uh, literal, uh, lateral. Okay. Anybody, anybody who has a knowledge of Git, can you tell me what is the difference between fork and branch? Because if you know GitLab, you the interviewer will assume that you know Git very well. Git is a technology, version control technology. So that whoever implements that technology is the tool. And one tool, very famous tool is GitHub. Other one is Bitbucket. OK, and this one is the GitLab. But so you must understand what is difference between fork and branch. So I know. So I know. Forking creates a full copy of your. It is like a clone. You are cloning the entire repository from somewhere to somewhere. Whereas branching only adds a branch to your existing tree. So you are branching from the master branch or the main branch to some other feature branch. So whatever is available in the master branch will be available to the feature branch to start with when you create that branch. That is very important. It is not cloning. You are you are copying all the content of the master branch to the uh, branch. The newly created branch, whereas cloning, cloning means you are you are dumping everything. You are forking everything from the repository from one place to the other place. How could you explain how does the CI/CD pipeline works? Again, I will not waste my any time. A continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline automates the software delivery process. It is that is the buzzword automation. You must mention this term automation. So why do you create a CI/CD pipeline? Because I want to automate the execution of the jobs. That is one thing. So there can be in an interview, there can be long winded. These are all short answers questions, but there can be long winded questions. Can you say, tell me, how would you set up and configure GitLab CI/CD pipeline from scratch? So you have to scratch your brain, collect yourself, be calm. And try to understand what are the steps. So if you are very good in GitLab or creating any pipeline, whether in Jenkins or GitLab, doesn't matter. You will go through all these steps. These all things are available in my uh, in the. In in our training site. So if you are registered and I, I hope you are registered, you can go into our site and get hold of all these things. Same thing. Can you explain how you use GitLab runner? This is the GitLab runner. Always think first of all, always, you must be a good listener. Always try to listen to the question very carefully because there is a trick. There is an answer within the question itself. 
and how it feeds into the CI CD pipeline. Now, this is a big long winded interview question. So you can go through this. So always collect before you know this is a this is going to be a big answer. Do not try to answer it, answer it in a shortcut way. Try to give it your whatever knowledge you have. Explain it fully. The interviewer is judging you not only from what answer you are giving. They want to know whether you, first of all you know. See, interviewers never try to judge what you do not know. They always try to because I was also working in IBM. I was I had taken a lot of interviews. What our principle was that we should judge a person who is sitting for the interview as to know how much that person knows. We never judge a person on how much that person doesn't know. That is a bad interview. So be confident. You do not fake your answers. Never try to fake your answers. If you do not know, simply say. You are you are working on that. Exact exactly. We you have not covered the entire topic on that, but uh, you have a plan to do it. Uh, you do not say if you do not know any answer, do not try to fake it. And if you know an answer, don't try to answer it in very short. That is my whole session today. OK. I thank you very much. Appreciate your patience.